afternoon and happy Sabbath. Um, if you could join me as we open in a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you for being with each and every one of us through the Sabbath. We recognize that the Sabbath was given to us to reset and take a step back from our busy lives to take care of our mental well-being. And I pray that um, through the various activities that each and every one of us did through the Sabbath, we may have made use of it in its right purpose, setting aside for something special that we can take advantage of. I pray that today's study may be part of that specialness that we can um, be blessed by. We ask that your Holy Spirit may be with us through the study as we continue to dig out who we are, where we sit, and what that means. Um, and I ask for your blessing upon upon each and every one of us as we discuss the various ideas we'll go through. This is my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so for the past few weeks um, leading up to today, I know I've said this, I've said this uh, every week, um, that hopefully we'll, we can wrap up uh, the study that we've been doing in, in I don't want to say dissecting, but understanding this comparison between liberal and radical feminism and seeing different stages in humanity's life um, in where this fight for rights or uh, this fight for the imagining of a new kingdom has taken place in different different areas and different ways. Um, and so we've gone through different histories, different issues, gone through different waves in feminism and the different things that were being addressed. And so last week's study was dedicated to, to looking at this system, if we want to call it that, the system, this institution, this way of thinking about knowledge and how knowledge is, is generated, how knowledge is held, um, how do we relate to to information, to what is truth? Um, and we we looked at it from the perspective of of society as a whole. Um, so if you want to put it in the terminology that we use with external and internal, we looked at the external first, and then we took what we gleaned from that external, and we then started discussing whether there are implications um, of that with how we relate to knowledge internally. Um, and so we went back and forth in those discussions. And we ended off last week um, with me suggesting that each of us look back at that time period where Elder Tess did a series of studies called Understanding Feminism. Um, and so the thought behind that was, if we can look and see how she described it in, in the context in which we were in as a movement, and then we look at what point Elder Palminder was trying to make um, about a month ago in comparing liberal and radical feminism, we can meet together and see, okay, were they saying the same thing? Were they saying different things? Was Elder Pamanda building on what Elder Tess was saying? Um, was he saying something different or giving a different perspective? Um, what, what's, what's the relationship between these two studies that were introduced about radical and liberal feminism? Um, so, um, I guess the question is, did, did anyone have the opportunity or the time to do that, to, to look back into that um, and rewatch some of those old, old videos, older material? I, I did actually, but, and I went through some of the notes, 
Not mm -hmm. sure how it's going to remember, but I did do it last week. <laughs> okay, great. So then I can be asking hey. you the question. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I also did my homework. Fantastic. Um, so well, I know I who to pick on. No, I wasn't giving you any ideas, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So the idea for today's study is um, we're going to, we've we've touched on knowledge, and now I want to see how how these two ways of approaching feminism relate to beauty and appearance so not just um adornment but just how expression is is pervaded in society the way we express ourselves with our dress with what we put on our bodies and and etc and um before we do that we can we can take a step back and and let's go back um and look at uh at least how elder tess defined liberal and radical feminism so for those that did their homework what can you remember that we have so now i'll say present um to express what we've been discussing um as being the differences between liberal and radical feminism so liberal is we'll say working within the system and radical is seeking to change the system And now, who wants to give me how liberal feminism was was described? And you can, in however you want to describe it, you can do that. If you want to give history, if you want to give context, if you want to give the specific issues that were being addressed, um, as much as you can remember from how Elder Tess described liberal feminism. Who, who wants to be the first volunteer? I will just pick on the people that said they went over the notes. <laughs> so, Emma, do you want to go first? What do you remember? About what definitions of radical and liberal? Yeah. Difference. Um... Well, that's it in summary, I think, is this is this recognition of wants to take so radical feminism wants to take down the foundation. That's where it comes from the idea of going back to the roots, I think. They see sexism everywhere, they pay attention. I'm just looking at some of the notes. Wants to deconstruct and remake society because they see that sexism is at the very foundation, is built into society. Okay. Whereas liberal feminism wants to bring women into the structure of society. Mm -hmm and work to reform to get equality through legal and i guess educational means mm -hmm. are you saying that's how other tests described liberal feminism uh i just saw it and i can't find it in here yeah it was radical feminism she talks about deconstructing society mm -hmm. um there was a nice definition i just saw it and i've lost it in the notes Sorry. um Spelt it wrong, that's why. Can't remember liberal. I think it works within the mainstream of society, mm -hmm. wishes to bring women into the structure of that society. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we just said, really. Um, key difference. Yep. Radical versus liberal. Okay. Yep, um, that's, that's fair. Uh, it focuses on achieving gender equality through political and legal reform within the framework of liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. It works within the structure of mainstream society to integrate women into that structure. Yeah. Okay. Um, Charity Blessing, you wanted to say something? 
actually, I didn't want to say something because oh. people are not talking. I then say that. Oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I think Elder Tess <clears throat> defined liberal and radical feminism in the presentation slash presentations, you know, mm-hmm. that's you the same way that Elder Fominda defined them recently. Mm-hmm. Liberal feminism seeks to work within the system. Radical seeks to overthrow or change the system. The system. But, yeah. But another thing I did notice, though, in Elder Tess's presentation mm-hmm. is that she she defined liberal feminism as, in terms of its relation to the statement the person was political mm-hmm. and did the same with radical feminism. So she said that, in fact, what she did first was to define what the personal is political meant. So just, just to be sure, um, in explaining what she said, am I also sharing what what I think about what she said, or is just what she no, said? No, just what she said. Okay. So she defines liberal feminism as not seeing the personal as being political. And then radical feminism as seeing the personal as political. That's another thing. Okay. Also, she she focused on the issue of individual freedom mm-hmm. in that presentation. Um, and connected with that issue of individual freedom was the beauty standards of society. So that is to say, when people take up the beauty standards and call themselves feminists, they are reflecting the individual freedom of the Republican Party, which is the persecuting power of end time Bible prophecy, basically. Yeah. Um, let's see, there was one more thing I wanted to say about. Oh, yeah, she said all the victories. Like most, she said most, most of the victories of second wave feminism were won by radical feminism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's the last thing I wanted to say for now in terms of the um, definition she said about feminism and the things that she said relating to those definitions. Yeah. So let's, let's start with, um, I think that's what I picked up as well um, when I rewatched those videos, and I think I think from from what's been said at least, um, can people see that they're being defined in the exact same way? That one is both of them are are seeing that there's this dual relationship to the systems of of the world. Um, that liberal feminism is seeking to integrate women into this already patriarchal system and radical feminism is seeking to to uproot that system and create a new system. And so I want to start at, at second wave feminism. When, when we started our studies, we went through first wave feminism and the victories that were won by first wave feminism. And we characterized them as being victories won by liberal feminists because of the legal rights that were won by the suffragettes. There was a specific issue that we we zoned into when looking at the suffragettes, which was the right to vote. But in that history, which we didn't touch on, which Elder Test did touch on, was there was a small component of, of beauty standards within that. But it was really within this the second wave where it starts getting critiqued um, at a found foundational level. And so she she 
points out that there's these two, uh, I don't want to say, uh, how do you call them, beauty pageants, um, Miss America and Miss World that happened in 1968, 1970. And you have protests that, that of us, protests that happen in, in retaliation to these beauty pageants that, that, ha that take place in America. And there was a leading feminist at the time who popularized a phrase, the personal is political. And then she goes on to define them. And what I found interesting is, is how Altatest defines it. And when you read Carol Hanich's paper, at face value, they seem like two different definitions. But what I think is the reality is that they're the same, just two sides of a different coin. So to quote verbatim, um, Elder Tess's words in defining the personal is political, um, is that the choices a woman makes privately in her home, in her marriage, in her lifestyle are political choices. So she's relating choices to politics. So there's this relationship between the choices and it's not just women. She decides to um, speak about women, but um, it's, it's the choices that people make privately as being political choices. So it's, it's all about choice. So the relationship between choice and politics. There's this relationship between the two. And then she says, this is an opposition to mainstream feminism that sees these things as private matters, i.e. the choices that people make in their homes, in their marriages, in their lifestyles. Um, these are private for said liberal feminist. And then she points out that they were happy with legislative changes but they separated their private lives from political action. I just want us to see how in, in describing this phrase in that way, tells you everything that there is to know about this relationship between the system, is the work being done within it, or is the work being done to overthrow it? Um, are the choices, how we view society and how it should be run, what is, um, what are the norms between genders? Is that being integrated into said system or is that being done to overthrow said system? And why she underlined, if I can say, or brought out choice is I think that when we look at prophets in the Bible, um, when we look at Ellen White's writings, um, we never take verses out of the context in which they were written. And so I want us to, to zoom out at the context in which this emphasis on choice or individual freedom was being made. In those Vespers that she did, um, I think it was towards the tail end of 2021. Um, in, th in that Vesper series, what was the theme theme of that whole series of studies? If if anyone recalls, we went over them uh, some time ago. It was this understanding of the ethos between Republicans and Democrats. So the wider, broader context of, we'll say the movement, is understanding how individual choices relate to politics, to um, governments, to systems. And so when Aldertes zooms into the beauty industry, as I understood it at least, it's it's said within a specific context of understanding how our individual freedoms to do and say what we choose affect wider society. Uh, 
So all all I wanted to do in that in that small exercise is is demonstrate or show how how Alda Parminda describes liberal and radical feminism is no different to how it was described in the past, just with different emphases because of different points being made um, at the times in which the studies were done. So when Alda Tess describes it in this way, seeing the personal is political as related to choice, if anyone's read that that pamphlet that Carol Hanich um, wrote, um, what was it about? Is that what she was saying in that? Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the origins of of this statement, the personal is political. I read it, but I can't remember now. It's so long ago, isn't it? Two years. Do you remember think... anything? Mm -hmm. Go, Magda. Sorry, could you could you repeat the question? Sorry, before Magda speaks. It was this statement, the personal is political. Um, it was popularized in um, this article that Carol Hanich wrote. Um, and she didn't give the article this this title. It was given by the editors or the publishers. But I just wanted to ask in that paper, if anyone has read it, what was what was the point that was being made in that? Is it this same point that Alda Tess is making when she describes it as personal choices in relation to the system? Or politics, should I say? Yes. So, Magda. Okay. Wanted... Thanks. I just want to first ask if Natalie won't remember something because she was asked first. Or she... think... Thanks, Magda. I think it was just what Persis has just said. I think it's to do with that, but my memory doesn't serve me well. Okay. I I don't remember that far as well, but I remember she was talking about meetings they had. And um, how she saw importance to talking about things which they are experiencing, uh, because she has realized that's affecting like large, like a lot of women. Um, yeah, I I remember that. I remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she I sees remember. that it's affecting all these women, the same issues that are being spoken about by different women um, in different contexts, in different homes, are facing these same issues. And what's the conclusion she draws from that? Magda? The personal is politics. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to state the, the slogan um, because she didn't use it. <laughs> I can't remember how, how she used it, what she used. But I can guess that, um, yeah, but that's affecting us um, in society. It's it's like a systematic, it's like a systematic yeah. thing, right? Yeah. What does that so mean? It does, mm -hmm. it, so it does impact um, lots of people. Um, it is the system, the way is the system. So mm -hmm. it does affecting, I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> on the right track um yeah so so it's 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 um basically it's affecting so many people because the way the system the everything function the way people yeah yeah so So you have, thank you, Magda. Um, that's how I understood it as well. So you have Carol Hanich, which points out or sees or recognizes that there's all these individual women with their individual experiences in life who are being affected by the same thing. And so if they're being affected by the same thing, then all this sexism that's taking place in their lives is as a result of politics, of the political system that they live in, as you've said. So there's politics 
or the political system that is affecting the person. So it's the pressures that politics puts on the person um, and creates this, this patriarchal society. That's the take home point from, from her is that your, your suffering, your um, bad marriage, your abuse, your um, bad pay, all the things that we can see as being a result of sexism, patriarchy is as a result of patriarchy. It's because the system is against you. Um, and so, so that's how she's described it. It's how the politics pushes or impacts or affects the person. Going back to how Aldertes described the personal is political, this was something that, that it boggled my mind, at least at the time. But as I've thought about it a bit more clearly, um, I can see how it's the same definition. What boggled me or confused me was how well this test describes it is instead of being this way around or solely being this way around, how politics affects the individuals in that society to, to uphold this, this systemic oppression, it's this recognition that there are choices that this person makes that let me wrap this up that affect wider society, that affect politics. And so if we were to think of what makes patriarchy patriarchy, or if we were to think of what sexism is in general, we would describe it as being the, um, which is the definition that, that she um, read out. I don't know where she got that definition, but it's the norms, values, and attitudes that uphold social inequality. So that uphold patriarchy or this system, this political system. So it's the recognition that the choices that people make that perpetuate the same gendered norms or values, how we value the genders and roles in society and the attitudes that we have towards women, these choices in, in marriages, in relationships, in how we adorn ourselves, how we present ourselves, all these choices impact politics. So it's this circle, it's this circular um, relationship between the personal and the political. So it stops being the personal is political solely, and it be and it it's inverted. The political is personal as well. So when Aldertes described it as the choices that impact politics, that's what confused me. It was okay. You're saying this thing, but the originators of, we'll say the slogan, where it, it's derived from, describe it a different way. So is it one or the other? But how I understand it is, is that it's this dual nature thing. It's, it's both. It's how we uphold patriarchy through our choices, and it's how patriarchy affects our lives as well um, in the context of women and and those that don't have power, more broadly speaking. Um, does that make sense? It is. <clears throat> yep. Yes, I think it makes sense. I, I, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to say something about, about that, about what Elder Jess did. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll use an example. Sure. I think the example I'll give is our position on LGBTQ equality. Mm -hmm. That if you consider the position we have, it's unique in that I don't think there's any other group of people on the planet that attribute LGBTQ equality solely to to our to our generation as as a, as a, as a phenomenon that's only been that has begun to be recognized somewhat in our generation. Because 
Elder Tess not only challenged the Christian position, the mainstream Christian position, which was essentially homophobic, but also challenged the mainstream liberal position in society, basically, which is this idea that ancient civilizations had homosexual relationships. Mm -hmm. And what we are seeing today is a continuation of that. So she she basically used you know our methodology radical feminist methodology which is trace the story get to the root of it identified the source of homophobia which is people's views on gender and particularly the feminine how people view and understand the feminine and gender roles this is the root of homophobia mm -hmm. and she also showed how every pagan society that has existed from the time of Abraham and Sodom, you could, of course, go be before that, but the time of Sodom, um, she spoke of Greece, particularly, and pagan Rome, mm -hmm. and identified how these societies that have been traditionally seen by liberals, like left-wing people, to be liberal and homophilic or basically pro-homosexuality were actually not. And that the practices that they had were just as sexist as your conventional heterosexual relationships, right? So it's only when you get to the sexual revolution in the late 1900s, after second wave feminism had begun, that you begin to have a radical shift towards how gender and sexuality is viewed which leads to what we see today as um, LGBTQ equality, you know, and in some countries actually having the right to marry as um, part of the LGBT community. So the point I'm trying to make is Elder Tess used our prophetic message and methodology combined with, you know, the, the radical feminist approach, but it was mainly from a prophetic point of view to make a definition that was different from the rest of society, but is still accurate because there's evidence to back it up. Mm -hmm. And I'm not necessarily saying in, in a general context that she's the first person to recognize how personal decisions or personal choices influence society, you know, like, society influences us but we influence society as well i'm not suggesting that she was the first one to recognize that but what i am saying is it's, it seems to me that she was identifying something that probably liberal feminists themselves in the world would deny and that is that they don't really believe the personal is political because when i read about the personal is political what i've noticed is this phrase is not only used nor attributed to radical feminism only, but feminism in general and the different schools of thought that branched out of feminism, except maybe cultural feminism, but, you know, like mainstream feminism definitely associates itself with this statement as much as radical feminism does. I think like Elder Paminda mentioned in his presentation, that the liberal feminists would argue, yes, we believe the personal is political. But in that presentation, for me at least, what I thought is she identified uh, again how it doesn't matter what the liberal feminists profess, they don't recognize that the, you know, adopting beauty standards, since you are speaking primarily within the context of beauty standards, that when they adopt beauty standards, they are essentially speaking against that profession. So even if they were to profess that the person is political, they are going against their own profession because taking a position of, you know, basically adopting the standards of beauty within the sexist system um, is more of a right-wing position than it is a left-wing position. So it's a position related to freedom and individual freedom than it is related to equality. And that's something she did again through our prophetic methodology you know, she was making a prophetic point to identify this issue that this issue that liberal feminist approach to equality 
is actually related, it's, it's, it's more relatable to the right wing and their way of thinking than it is related to the left wing, which is something that she had already been building about, you know, like you said, the ethos of left and right. So that's how I saw it within that context, that when she made the application of that statement, because I had the same dilemma that you had, that, okay, what you're saying all the days is not actually how they used it. But I see her actually making a prophetic point within that context of left wing and right wing and identifying that these people are wrong. The same way she did with the liberals and homosexuality, that it doesn't matter what they say, they're wrong because of this. And I thought she did the same thing. That yes, they might say the person was political, but they're wrong because of this. In, in terms of yeah, their profession, because they don't understand what they're doing. Prophetically, you can show that what they're doing is right wing, not left wing. I, I hope you get what I'm asking. Yeah. To. I do. And I, I, I want to use that that thought to dovetail into our discussion of beauty standards and and where you see this this merging of feminist thought in in its full uh capacity or however you want to call it, expression, with right-wing thought. Um, in those studies, and I think when you when you look online, it's, it's, it's hard to identify where these different waves start and end. But as a general framework, um, I'll just use the waymark that, that Aldertes used as being 1963 where the second wave starts and then she uses 1989 uh, for whatever point that she wants to make as being the bookend of this time period of second wave feminism and it starts off with the publishing of this book by uh, a woman Betty Fried Fried Frieden um, called The Feminine Mystique um, and in that book um, she She's not fighting for legal rights in the same way that suffragettes were. Um, she's criticizing how we think about women um, and their roles in life and how we think about men. So she's, she's describing or critiquing the assumptions that we as a society, as a whole, have about women and what it means to be woman and and man and the different aspects of their lives from housework to marriage to their sex lives in general. So it's this shift, this minor shift in, in thinking about what's being addressed. So we've gone for from this fight for a legal right to vote in the context of suffragettes to now questioning, okay, hold on as was demonstrated in tracing back um, LGBTQ rights um, or where homosexuality uh, or homophobia has its, has its roots in trying to understand where does this neglect or negligence or reluctance to for women to have rights come from and Instead of attacking the rights, it was this recognition that maybe we need to address the mindset that society has. And so, as I said at the beginning, you have these protests that take place, and now you have women protesting beauty standards, and radical feminism and liberal feminism um, have this, have this, you see this friction starting to take place between the two. Um, and that brings us to the 1980s and the 1990s, where the world is, I'll speak to the Western world, is, is coming out of the industrial age. And you have neoliberalism becoming the dominant philosophy of how you can think about the economy. And what liberalism, neoliberalism um, emphasizes or pushes within the economic setting is deregulation. So instead of having the government um, intervening in so much of society's lives, let's let society run itself and the economy will sort itself out. 
And this is not the birth, but you see it becoming this unrestrained force that it is today of free market capitalism. And it's this on in the right wing, um, in right wing parties, both in America and here in the UK, being the cornerstone of their of their mantra of how we're going to resolve the economic problems is free market. It's optimal to order society. Um, at the end of the day, we'll get to a place where um, things will be good for everyone. If you've heard the term trickle down economics, that if people are left to make decisions about businesses and how much bread should cost, um, then money will trickle down from those that have plenty to those that don't have, and they will be lifted up out of poverty. So in the United States, you have Ronald Reagan. And here in the UK, you have Margaret Thatcher, who are implementing these policies. That's this big shift from where we were under, um, what's, what's your, your favorite president's name, Natalie? Jay, I think it was John F. Kennedy. Who, no, it wasn't John F. Kennedy. It was um. Who implemented the oh. Green New Deal? Yeah. Green New Deal. FDR. FDR. That's it. FDR. FDR. Um, and so you have this era where the government, after World War Two, has said, um, "We are going to socialize uh, America, and that's how we're going to bring people out of poverty." So you have Ray Ronald Reagan come into power after all those years and and decides that there's a better way of doing this. And you have Mar Margaret Thatcher on the other end uh, here in the UK doing the same thing um, through tax cuts and, and et cetera. And this spreads because of globalization. Um, these neoliberal ideas spread globally. And we have an expansion of corporations rising up in these Western countries and them speaking to each other or working through trade and you have trade agreements. And for that society, it brought on, on the surface, it looked like it, it, it was bringing people out of poverty. We can go into why it's not as simple as that, but that's what it looked like this market fundamentalism. And so if, if, if what I want to take from that is that the key components to this market fundamentalism or um, free market capitalism is that it centers on minimal government intervention and um, it's controlled by the choices of empowered citizens. So these empowered citizens who are free to make choices for themselves and for their businesses would eventually create this ideal social and economic structure. And the state shouldn't get involved because consumer choices would lead to that better idea of the state. So this is all happening in the 1980s and the 1990s, separate to what's happening with feminism. And now, that same thought, or that same school of thought starts influencing feminist thought. And liberal feminists, as we've described, get influenced by this idea that individual choices, consumer choices, are empowering not only for yourself, but for wider society. Because if you are empowered, um, if you are free to make choices for yourself, you can be empowered. And that's the exact same way that Alda Tess describes liberal feminism. Empowerment through choice. You are empowered because you chose it. And hence why you see this marriage between, as Blessing was describing, right-wing thought Republicans who are all about free market capitalism and liberal fem liberal feminist thought is because it's all powered by the free choices on in the economic sense of consumers and that will regulate society 
and liberal feminists empowered because you chose it you choose these beauty practices and they no, no longer oppressive because you chose them and so in the economic sense on the one hand you have this the rhetoric of agency of consumers the choice that consumers can make in essence if there's two supermarkets and one price is higher you can go to the other one and so if you go to the supermarket where prices are lower that would enforce the other supermarket to lower their prices so that's the at a basic level what this thought of free markets would how it would empower consumers because it would force prices down that's not what happened but anyway this agency this choice this consumer empowerment then trickles its way into liberal feminist thought as we as we've been uh, describing and women under this umbrella become transformed into knowledgeable consumers because they could now exercise their power of choice in this market of 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 beauty products they could pick and choose from the practices that that they want so there's this marriage between republican free market economies and liberal feminist view so how do the two your liberal feminists and your radical feminists how do they look at the beauty industry as a whole you have lib fems and you have radical fems so yes society um and society says beauty is xyz this is what is beautiful your mainstream your political atmosphere has a specific way of describing this is beauty so liberal feminists view the beauty industry as a sphere where having previously not being allowed to exercise choices and agencies eh, with regards to how they dressed what they put on their bodies now argue that they are empowered because they get to choose the beauty practices freely not only we'll say we we're, we're isolating how women relate to this system of beauty but it can be applicable to to wider areas but just for the point that we're making and these choices that feminists or women make are less about social coercion but it's empowering because if you recall from last week it's this liberation through integration for so long they've not women have not been allowed to make choices about they uh, themselves about what they wear so if you were to think of a wife and a husband the husband decides you wear this when you go out the house and when i'm home dress in this certain way and the liberal feminist comes and says no i get to make that choice for myself now so they want to be part of society women want to be part of society the society that's excluded them from making these choices all along and as we've been saying with radical feminists and their view and how it starkly contrasts this perspective and their argument being this whole beauty industry perpetuates patriarchal standards from its from the bottom up and so whatever choices that you are making will say women and men the choices that you make in the clothes that you wear um, within this industry are constrained by broader social pressures and gender norms so are you actually making a free choice do you actually have free will to make a choice that is separate and your own and so it's this critique against choice and whether choice really does exist in an industry that is embedded with capitalist and patriarchal 
um, ideologies. So one of the key things that we see as differing between these two streams or schools of thought is that liberal feminists fight for legal rights and why it's so hard to identify or pinpoint the wins, if you want to call it that, that are won by radical feminists, because it's no longer just concerned with the legal rights that women have. It's now critiquing an ideology, a way of thinking, a way of viewing the world. When we spoke about Paul and the Christian age, what we didn't touch on was Jesus and Jesus's mission here on this earth, what Jesus was addressing. And a, a verse came to mind when I, was, when I was contemplating, how did Jesus relate to his mission here on earth? And let me find the verse. Um, it's uh, two seconds, sorry. It's, it's Matthew 5, verse 27 to 28. And whether you would put this in the box as being sin or not is up for discussion, is up for debate. But it's essentially um, Jesus extolling, if that's a word, um, that if anyone looks upon a woman in order to lust, they've already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus was making a broader point, but it's it's stuff like this where you see that Jesus recognizes the institutions that exist currently in society. But what Jesus is going to address through attacking the heart, through attacking the mind, or at least how we relate to humanity, is this belief on Jesus's part and this recognition on Jesus's part, that if you're going to change society as a whole and stop oppression, you need to go after the mindset, the ideology, the core, the root of the issue. And the root of the issue is found in how we think about genders, how we think about races, how we think about humanity as a whole. Um, I just wanted to bring that in because I know that when we spoke about Paul, we described a lot of his work as aligning with what a liberal feminist would do in seeking to integrate people into that society. But in different ways, we can see how Jesus, in his mission, was working as a radical feminist in wanting to create a new system. And that was his plea, essentially, to... to um, the, the Pharisees is that this kingdom that I'm creating is not a physical kingdom. It's, it's one in which there's a new way of thinking about how humanity should relate to each other in general. So we've gone through different systems, different spheres of life in which feminists seek to reach equality. Um, and I hope now we can look at the different rights that were won by feminists and identify were they won by liberal feminists or were they won by radical feminists. So I'm going to go through three and in quick succession. The right to vote. Who won those rights and why? Liberal. Why? Why would you put them in the bucket of liberal feminists? Because it's within the system they're just trying to say, yeah, you know, keep it the way it is, but, you know, allow us to vote. Mm -hmm. So not seeking to abolish that system, but access it because women have been deprived from this right for a long time. We just want to participate equally within the system reproductive rights and the right to abortions, to contraception, and etc. I think, wasn't that liberal as well? Or am I wrong about that? 
Why would you say that? Well, we could go back to the personal as political. Mm -hmm. you know, we do what, or what we want autonomy. We do what we want. We want liberty. We do what we want. But you know, you, you give us obviously make it law so we could do what we want. Don't take down the system. Bring the our right. Give us rights. I'm sure radical feminists would would. I know, but if you look in history and you look at the information, I'm yep. sure. Yeah. So it's. it's not concerned well uh how can i say this um i don't not in a rude way but not concerned about what you read um as whether it's liberal or radical just based on how we've discussed it how would you identify them i hope that came across proper which one would we identify mm -hmm. reproductive rights were they won by liberal or radical feminists I'm still saying sticking to liberal. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone with another opinion? And uh, when you do answer, say why. Why you categorize it as one by either branches of these. Um, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think uh, we'd categorize it under liberal. And why I say this is because the push for women's rights to an abortion was connected with the legal system. So it's, you need to secure the legal right of a woman to an abortion within the existing system. So it wasn't a, a complete overthrow of the system that existed. Um, and then, you know, you have a new system that ensures women have the legal right to an abortion, but rather it was, if I could say, a compromise, just like the others where, okay, fine, the political system will integrate this issue of women's right to an abortion into the existing legal system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the right to vote? I didn't hear any objections, so we can categorize them as being won by liberal feminists. Does anyone see it differently as reproductive rights? So the right to abortion, the right to contraception. It is. We, we don't have an answer, I guess. I suppose maybe Blessing just alluded to it as to what it would have looked like if a radical feminist had fought that corner. If we're going to say that's liberals that have won those. What's the alternative? So remember what there was a an 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 analogy that um we've discussed in the past of patriarchy. Uh I'm gonna draw it as a pyramid, um, just just for illustrative purposes, as being this thing, the system. We'll call it the system in which we live in. Um, what upholds the patriarchy? It's norms, gendered norms, so how we view gender, um, ideas about power, about gender. It's the different ways in which we think about women's roles or about how people should operate, what um, where value lies in people. So all that, how we think about all that is what upholds the patriarchy. So reproductive rights. If humanity were to relate to power and um, differently than how it does currently in the system of patriarchy, if they were to relate to women and men and sex and um, etc. in a different fashion, would we would there be a necessity for these rights to exist as in would there be outcomes that necessitate this being the case if that initial seed was addressed of power dynamics in sexual relationships in um autonomy behind how we view 
women and 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 men would all these things need to exist if it was addressed at its fundamental core i don't know does that question make sense emma because you asked um, yes i think so yeah so they would not they wouldn't need to be this right to protect women from these things because we would have addressed um, under a new system. I know it sounds, um, I'd, for lack of a better term, wishful thinking, mm -hmm. uh, where everything is okay. So let's think about the US Constitution and the 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights that get added to, to the Constitution. You have this new system being created, democracy, where people vote. I, I alluded to it in the first study that we did. And the Bill of Rights come to protect minorities. So if the Constitution and if humanity related to power in a healthy way, not how it does now, would there need to be a Bill of Rights to protect those people who do not have power? No, because our view, our vision of power would be fundamentally different. It would be baked into the protections that humanity have as a whole because we view power radically different. So that's me trying to explain why a fight for reproductive rights to exist in a world where power dynamics between men and women exist wouldn't need to be that fight because you would have already addressed the core of the issue that lead to these problems in the first place. So in my mind, that's, that's the vision that a radical feminist has. Let's address the root cause that leads to these problems occurring um, down the road. Does that answer your question? even if partially. Partially. <laughs> Great, yes. That's good. Yeah. Come on. Could I, yeah, could I just say something about that? Mm -hmm. You know, Elder Paminda said all these rights that <clears throat> were won during second wave feminism were won by liberal feminists. Mm -hmm. In the presentation that you pointed us to, Elder T said most of those victories were won by radical feminists. Yeah. So it sounds rather contradictory. Did he say but... second wave feminism or specifically first wave feminism? No, she said second wave. Not no, Elder Tess, second... Palminda. Yeah. Elder Palminda. Oh, okay. Sorry, I, I wasn't getting into the specifics with Elder okay. Palminda. I don't remember sure. him mentioning which wave. I think he just said, because I think someone had said something and then he responded and said, no, but all these rights that are there in a we, generic sense mm -hmm. yeah he said, yeah all these rights that we have and he said we when i say we but i mean women women mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. we're won by liberal feminism so yeah. so what i'm saying is it seems it seems like there's a contradiction between what elder paminda said and what elder test said but there's there's something elder test read that made me start thinking a bit differently about the point she was making mm -hmm. and it's from an academic paper Mm -hmm. titled Kinds of Feminism, mm -hmm. um, which which was published, uh, I don't know the author, sorry, <laughs> but it was published by the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just want to quote a portion of it that relates to this issue about, was it liberal or radical feminism? Because it seems like it's not that clear cut, like it's not a straightforward issue, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So this one wasn't really, it wasn't speaking, okay, it was speaking about liberal feminism. Mm -hmm. But, okay, let me just read it. It's fine. Let me just read it. It says, defining liberal feminism, this is the variety of feminism that works within the structure of mainstream society to integrate women into that structure. Then it says, its roots stretch back to the social contract theory of government instituted by the American Revolution. So this paper, actually traces liberal feminism's roots to the American Revolution and the, you know, an ideology related to the American Revolution, which I found interesting. And then she says, 
he, he or she, sorry, I don't know who it is. Abigail Adams and Mary Wollstonecraft were there from the start. So these were, Abigail Adams, I think, was the spouse of John Adams, the one who became president. Mm -hmm. So they were there from the start, proposing equality for women. As is often the case with liberals, they slog along inside the system, getting little done amongst the compromises until some radical movement shows up and pulls those compromises left of center. Mm -hmm. This is how it operated in the days of the suffragist movement and again with the emergence of the radical feminists. So I found this particularly interesting that, you know, for as much as liberal feminism did, or rather liberal feminist approach was used to secure these rights we are speaking of, it seems like what actually jolted them to sufficient action, what allowed them to get enough impetus, if I could say, or energy, the engine, the driving force, the underlying driving force, which you could call the unsung hero that wasn't spoken about, was radical movement or radical feminism in this case. So basically the point that this paragraph was making that I thought it was making is there's a discussion that is had or something that's realized in this case, you know, women need equality, but not enough is done until there's a movement radical enough to push those that are not doing enough to actually do more essentially. So whilst we wouldn't say the right to vote or, you know, some of these other legal victories are necessarily radical by our definition, you can still see the influence that radical feminism had on the victories that were won by liberal feminism. So she, she read that in connection with the statement she had made that all the victories that are there were won by radical feminism. Mm -hmm. So with that, I, I, I begin to see a bit of harmony in what Elder Tess said with what Elder Paminda said. Because yes, when it comes to integrating with the system, that's definitely liberal. But if we're going to talk about what actually pushed them under the hood to eventually, is, is eventually achieve what they did achieve, you can see the influence of radical feminism on them. So yeah, that's what I wanted to say about this liberal <laughs> radical feminist issue, issue and the rights that were won. <laughs> So the so, article is called Kinds of Feminism, actually. It's, it was done by the University of Alabama. Did you find Alabama. it on a forum or did Blessing or did you just search for it yourself? I searched for it for myself after Elder okay. quoted it. So I just took some keywords that she wow. read and then I looked for it. Wow. Uh, you, you Recently or back in 21? Oh, no, recently when I watched it again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So you're describing, okay. sorry, how this this spark is lit by radical feminists. If if we can think of radical feminists as seeking to change the ideology and recognizing that, hold on, this whole system is against us, is against, in this context, women and how women live. So we need to change the system. And the point that I think I understand what you're making, Blessing, is that when radical feminists jump on this train and recognize this, this oppressive system, and start voicing louder or raising their voices louder, it gives impetus to legal, to liberal feminists to go and fight for certain rights, the right to vote, reproductive rights, marital rights, et cetera, et cetera. Is that how I understood you? Yes, exactly. Because in the same paper, the, the next paragraph actually explains how radical feminism provides the bulwark of theoretical thought in feminism. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's the foundation for the rest of feminist flavors. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't have these other, of course, not talking about cultural feminism, because cultural feminism yeah. emerged in a different way. But when we talk about mainstream feminism, Mainstream feminism would not have existed were it not for radical feminism. So it actually says radical feminism was the cutting edge of feminist theory from approximately 1967 to 75. So they put pressure, you know. Yeah. For as much as we would say they didn't, they didn't achieve 
the goal that we want, which is a new system. Mm-hmm. But they definitely did create the theoretical foundation that we are building upon as a movement, mm-hmm. and also that helped propel liberal feminism to do what they did. So essentially, there would not have been those liberal feminist victories if radical feminism didn't exist. So, yeah. I, I remember also, well, I, I, I didn't do the homework, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I remember from around the time when I watched the video some time ago that um, Elder Tess did make that point of how the radical feminists are the ones that understood the problem with the patriarchy. And mm-hmm. they were, if we can say, the thought leaders behind feminism. They understood what the problem was with society, right? And they basically, uh, like I said, were the thought leaders within the feminist movement. And like, like Blessing said, we're the driving force to what uh, was then fought for within the feminist movement. So basically without the ideas and the thoughts of the, the, the radical feminists, the liberal feminists would have essentially not have, would not have like a platform to fight on, if, if I can say, to even win yeah. the, 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 you know, the, the, all those victories. Could we say, Charity Curtis, that radical feminists is the empowerment of the liberal feminists? Uh, maybe driving force. I don't know about empowerment. <laughs> foundation. <laughs> yeah, foundation makes more sense. Like, the liberal feminists had that platform to stand on. Like that was created by radical feminists because if they were to stand on their own, they they did not understand the problem as as how the radical feminists understood it. So I don't know how, what example I can give, you know. Yeah, if I think about it, <laughs> I, I I think the history suggests that liberal feminism would not have existed. Without radical feminism. If there wasn't radical feminism. Mm. And I think that was my question before when you said about what Elder Tess and Elder Paminda said. When Elder Paminda said that, I was wrestling with it because I'm like, wait a minute, radical feminists. And I remembered Elder Tess's point and it did seem to be contradictory. So I kind of hear what you're saying, bringing them together. But I, and but kind of what Charity's just said feels like that these things were radically, were radical feminism doing that. They were trying to see. I guess I'm questioning in my own head what a radical feminist would have done, knowing the whole system's defunct. How do we change it now? Would we not do the same thing and fight for the vote? Because we can't change anything unless we get a voice. So there's that. I think I said that before, though. It's just confusing the, the topic because you're saying it's what's the pr- we're talking about the think, approach. Go on. I think the the difficulty is that we're trying to to squeeze radical feminism into what they could have changed about society and once you go down that route i mean in a in a in a perfect society you would say a radical feminist stands up and says the political system is corrupt it's 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 against um minorities it's against women it's against um any marginalized group so let's create a new system And when we look back, we see that didn't happen. That does not happen. And from how I see it, that can't happen on this earth. And so radical feminists are stuck in in this position where they want, where we want a different kingdom, a different society that operates on different models, on different ways of thinking about gender, about race, both of these things being constructed by society. And so they're stuck. And then you have liberal feminists who stand up and say, we need to exist. Like we can theorize about a new version of events or we can fight for rights to just exist, which we have not done up to today. 
And so you have liberal feminists take this theoretical thought or these theoretical underpinnings and say, okay, it's great to envisage this new kingdom, but I want to exist today. And so you have liberal feminists fight for these different rights that you get um, in recognizing the inequality that exists in these different uh, spheres of life. So this is to go back to the question that you ask, what could radical have feminists have done? And as we're seeing, their hands were tied in terms of what they could have done um, in society or what could have been done today and tomorrow. And so instead, you have liberal feminists pick up on different elements of this envisaging of a new kingdom and then going on to fight for rights within the existing kingdom that they're in. Yes, Which is why we see Oh. Yeah, radical feminists with liberal feminists doing that because this is, this is, and I, they can't work outside the system, but they can do something to change it in that sense. And I don't so think I don't it, it, it was as, like, I know we're painting the story where maybe you may not have done this deliberately, where radical feminists and liberal feminists meet up and say, okay, let's do this. Um, you go and fight for the rights. Here's the theoretical paper about this new kingdom and liberal feminists. You go, there was not this, this, if anything, they see each other as a problem, but yeah. inadvertently, um, what I understood by the contribution blessing was make, making is that inadvertently liberal feminists, um, get influenced by radical feminist thought in, in some shape or form, and then just say, let's fight for our right to exist. Um, so it's not this agreement that they come to, to say we're stuck. So liberal feminists, you go and do the work. If anything, there's there's lots of antagonism between the two because of how they're addressing the problem, but there's cross-pollination yeah. nonetheless. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm not suggesting that radical feminists worked together with liberal feminists. Mm -hmm. But what I am saying is liberal feminism would not have existed without radical feminism. And that this article, I think explains well, the pressure that radical movements put on, if I can call them compromises. Mm -hmm. So I'm basically saying, like, I think you, 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 you put a good word here that inadvertently, radical feminism influenced the work of liberal feminism. And I think that's something that's also important to recognize that feminism in all its various flavors today has its source, apart from cultural feminism, again, I'm not talking about cultural feminism, has its source in the theoretical foundation laid by radical feminism. But that of course is a different point from when you actually look at the work that was actually done and the approach that was used, that was definitely a liberal feminist approach because it's integration within the existing system. Yeah. So I was just saying, you know, it seems like mm -hmm. the point that Elder Tess was making was a different point to the one that Elder Paminda was making. I think that's the conclusion of what I was actually trying to say. Because she was making it within the context of this passage I read, this academic paper. And Elder Paminda was talking about, I think, <laughs> how those victories were actually just, you know, working within the existing system. Yeah. So, can, can, can I ask something? I, I just want to understand something. Um, so, how I have understood um, the, the issue between radical feminism and liberal feminism is that you have a group of women basically okay more than just women it was both men and women i guess people who recognize that women are being oppressed in society they come together they form this movement right and then you have uh within that same group of people you have different thoughts or ways of approaching things and then you start having a split like um you start having uh, people like 
not agreeing on how things are supposed to be done or the approaches and all. And then you eventually have liberal feminism and radical feminism. That's how I understood it. And when you have that, they basically have a lot of debates about with the radical feminists saying, you know, we need to get rid of this. Like, for example, when you look at what Elder Tess, the examples Elder Tess gives with the Miss Universe and uh, the, the, those, uh, those beauty pageants. And she speaks about how the women who actually went and protested with the radical feminists. And then you have this uh, bin, I don't know if it was a bin or whatever, where they put all these, the makeups and the corsets and the wigs and all of that stuff. And they, they pretty much say, we want to get rid of this because uh, this is something that works against women, right? And then at the same time, they are fighting among themselves because you have the liberal feminists saying, okay, um, this is going to affect how society is going to look at us. At least let's keep a few things, you know, we don't want to look uh, too bad. After some guy wrote an article and uh, called them the bra burners and stuff. And then in that sense, like, that's for me it came out as though this was a group of people that were working together towards the 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 liberation of women basically right and for gender equality but they start having divergent views of how to approach the the problem and then you have this split between radical and liberal so i just wanted to understand that is that how it happened or liberal feminism existed in its own right if i can say oh it was its own group and then radical feminism was its own group i don't know if you understand my question sure from what i understand at least and i think with with every movement that has existed there's there's overlap and then there's so if we were to think of like a, a venn diagram um um, as rad femmes and lib femmes, um, from however far back you want to go um, with this fight for women's rights, um, we can go trace it all the way back to, if, if you want, to Eden itself um, after the curse. But let's just stick within the last 200 years, at least. Um, I think that women have 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 existed in both of these areas of of critiquing how we think about beauty standards so in some respect ellen white sits in that 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 place where she critiques hold on you know a woman's mind is is just as capable of of addressing things as a man's mind um so that's that's this a that's a radical thought because it's getting to the root of of why women and men have different jobs, and then she falls short um, in some other respects with regards to women as being this compromise um, in compromising with the system. So to answer your question, I don't think one existed independent of the other, um, like one movement. Um, uh, sorry, I don't think they existed like as one big bubble um, as feminists and then you had this breakaway branches. I think in different parts of the world, in America specifically, there were different women who recognized that, hey, we want the right to vote. And there were different women who questioned this whole liberal capitalist system um, is, is broken. It's, it's not advantageous to creating a, a good society and then you have overlap between then you get some people who see this who recognize this whole system is broken but i also want food on my table as a woman and so i'm gonna fight for my marital rights even though i recognize that this whole system is broken and this that's this intersection um that's how i understand it at least so it's 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 not that there's these two separate groups or one is born from the other. It's as with every social movement and the various social movement that happen, there's there's tension, there's marriage between them, there's overlap. It's it's fluid. Yeah. 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 Ye
if I can put it that way. Okay, so basically you're saying it's a, it's a these thoughts existed, like what Blessing was saying, that the, a liberal thought existed, can be traced back all the way back to what revolution? The American, the American Revolution. And the, this thought is there and it continues on. Mm-hmm. And then eventually you have sort of like the a formalization of of this this thought and group of people. You yeah. now have this name, the liberal feminists and the radical feminists kind of thing later yeah. on. Okay. So could I just say something quickly about the names though? Yeah, go for it. That, you know, like m- most of these movements don't really name themselves. The names yeah. are attributed to them yeah. by external sources. So like we call them radical, we'll call ourselves radical feminists, but if you look at where the term came from, they didn't name them so that here we are, we're radical feminists. What they did say is probably they said we're feminists. We're fighting for, you know, a change in or, or rather, let me say this, we are, we are politicizing the private sphere. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to bring attention to the oppression and experiences that women are going through within the existing system. And then, you know, these names are then put on them. And we look at it like after the fact, we say also oh, these radical feminists and those liberal yeah. feminists. I just wanted to say that about the name. So it's the that, thought that just existed. Yes. And you have a people that pick up that thought, sort of like a movement. Yes, definitely you had a movement. They coalesce into a movement. But I was just saying the naming happens mm-hmm. after the fact. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In the last five minutes, we won't have time to discuss it now, but I'll leave you with the thought, um, which we can pick up next week as a separate study. But as anyone is familiar with how I approach this issue. Um, I recognize it's a sensitive issue, um, but at least spend the week thinking about it. Um, When we think about LGBTQ rights, as was brought up earlier in the discussion, there are LGBTQ rights that are fought for by liberal feminists. That's why they're called rights, because in, in... the current system that we live in, um, these are rights that these people should have. And they are, as was pointed out, you have uh, in radical feminist school of thought, um, you have TERFs, um, trans exclusionary radical feminists, and trans inclusionary radical feminists. So we have this system that views gender norms in a certain way, that views men and women's roles as being distinct, as views how women and men dress as being distinct, how women and men adorn themselves as being distinct, how women and men, what their tendencies in society, how they walk, how they talk um, as being distinct, um, as how they speak, soft-spoken, loud-spoken, aggressive, passive, empathetic, um, whatever the opposite of empathetic is. Um, These distinct things so when we say that we are, sorry, not TERFs, when we say that we are trans-inclusionary radical feminists, I want us to think about what this I means. This Ideology. inclusion. Because that's, it's at least in the acronym, it's trans-exclusionary radical feminism and trans inclusive radical feminists what are we including transgender people into are we including them into this system that already exists what are we including them because when we think of these gender norms and in in comments that we keep making 
when referring to trans identity and trans children, we keep associating a person as being trans with how they relate to dress, how they relate to mannerisms, how they relate to choice of activities, and the easy assumption to make when we see a child is this boy is playing with Barbies. This boy likes dresses. This boy wants to make makeup. So this boy is trans. This boy wants to be a woman. So they are trans. If we describe it in that way, all we're doing is what liberal feminists do when they view the beauty industry, is seeing how trans individuals can be integrated into an already patriarchal system that stereotypes how men, women, and anywhere in between that present themselves. Um, as I said, I, I'm sorry for dropping this at the end of the study, but we can we can have that discussion next week, and that can be what our study is um, going forward, is what do we mean by inclusive? What are we including them into? Because my proposition, I'll lead with my proposition at least, is that trans individuals are just as affected by social conditioning as women are, as men are. And so when they see, when trans individuals see what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, it's that same patriarchal system that's codified these things for them. And in our minds, we see, no, their choices are their choices. But how we talk about these things, if, 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 if I can make that proposition, just fits right into that narrative about empowerment through choice and separating the personal from the political influences and vice versa, the political through the individual choices um, that are made. Curtis? Natalie. That's that's a a really brilliant point to end with because this is my point on Sabbath Buscon that I don't see radical feminist as a quality in the world because I know we have to if it, it's in, internal, it's external, you know, use a methodology, but I I just don't see it because of the point you've just said, is that they're not a quality for all in the sense why even bring it up? Why even have the acronym if there's a quality there, like you said, trans women are women. I know I'm not saying that as you said, but I just think I don't know if that was my point, but I, I think you. we in the movement is the only true radical feminist because, and I wouldn't even call us uh, TERFs with an I because of the point you just brought up. Okay, thank you. Um, but yeah as we go into next week. It's when we say we are inclusive, what does that mean? And then that begs the question of identifying what is a woman and what's a man? Um, but we've had that discussion before. It was more so just an identification that when we talk about trans identity, that we should catch ourselves and make sure that we're not just integrating trans individuals into an already patriarchal system. Exactly. Um, Good point. Let's close with a word of prayer. Um, dear God, um, thank you for the study that we've had. Uh, thank you for this discussion and, and seeing the harmony of your message. I think that was the point of the study today, is recognizing that over the last few years, you've been teaching us and all you've been doing is teaching us the same thing and articulating it in different ways, trying to make different the same point in different from different pers perspectives. And it's my prayer that as radical feminists, we may uh, come to a realization that uh, or an understanding of of what it is that we are fighting for. Are we fighting for our right to exist on this earth? Are we fighting for um, a new kingdom that you're trying to build up? 
Um, and when we relate to the different political issues that are taking place externally, that we may have a clear pinpoint understanding of where we stand and how we relate to these issues. Um, as has been demonstrated, you're doing something unique with us. Albeit we're inspired by the various themes that go on, you are teaching us in a way that is unique um, in some shape or form. Uh, so I pray thanking you. I praise your name as we go into a new week. Please be with us. Keep us safe. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.